The National Desk, America's News, now. Straight ahead on the National Desk, on alert. The dire warning from the Department of Homeland Security as the holiday season ramps up. And one county close to doubling its amount of deadly overdoses, turning to drug outreach programs to save lives. How bars are now playing a role in preventing more deaths. Plus, back on shelves. We're talking to a doctor about how much longer some popular meds could be difficult to find. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories that we've been following this week. A national rail strike averted after the president signed a bill blocking unions from going on strike just one week before the deadline. What benefit got cut out of the negotiations? And a domestic terrorism warning. The Department of Homeland Security sounding alarms about rising threats of violence, which places they say could be targeted. Plus, troubles in the tech industry as digital payment network Zelle deals with scam scandals, lawmakers feeling the pressure to take preventative action. Then, a crisis on the southern border. The Supreme Court holding a hearing as a record number of gotaways evade border security. Why the DHS says deportations have stalled. A possible nationwide rail strike now derailed after President Biden signed a bill to enact a contract negotiated between the rail companies and their workers. Both the House and Senate passed a bill quickly this week to beat the December 9th deadline. Otherwise, critical shipments would have been stopped early next week. Four out of 12 railroad unions rejecting that deal, wanting more paid sick leave, something the president says is one of his goals for all U.S employees and breaking it down by the numbers two billion dollars a day that's what the association of american Railroad says the strike would have cost the u.s economy according to the group 70 percent of coal moves across the u.s by rail along with 1.6 million carloads of food each and every year and 2.2 million carloads of chemicals 75 percent of new vehicles are also shipped via rail showing how railroads serve every sector of the economy. Meantime, a Christmas present many drivers would like to see. Gas prices may drop below $3 by the holiday. Price tracker Gas Buddy saying the price per gallon dropped by nearly 23 cents just last month and could keep falling through December. Meanwhile, payment problems. During the pandemic, the federal government rapidly distributed loans to businesses, and it's becoming clear that a large number of them were fraudulent. A new congressional report revealing financial technology companies tasked with delivering those loans were the ones who profited. The National Desk, Ryan Smith, breaking down the numbers. The congressional findings detail how multiple fintech companies charged with reviewing Paycheck Protection Program loans likely distributed tens of billions of fraudulent applications in a rush to get money out the door. The allegations were put out in a report by the House Select Committee on the coronavirus crisis, which oversaw trillions of dollars in pandemic aid. In a statement to the Washington Post, committee chairman Congressman Jim Clyburn said these companies, quote, refuse to take adequate steps to detect and prevent fraud despite their clear responsibility to safeguard taxpayer funds. The report also accuses the companies, which include Blue Acorn, Wampley, Cabbage, among others, of also taking in billions in fees off of these fraudulent loans. The subcommittee shared with us a video of Blue Acorn founder Nathan Reese flaunting his newfound wealth last year, his company reportedly making $120 million off of those transaction fees. Congress wrote the rules in a hurry, and the rules were very lax concerning this program, and the oversight uh, was hardly hardly apparent. At the beginning of the pandemic, the federal government quickly authorized the Paycheck Protection Program established by the CARES Act to help people stay afloat, which included more than 11 million loans to struggling small businesses. But it also gave fraudsters a chance to scam. Earlier this year, the Small Business Administration's Inspector General finding more than 70,000 loans 
totaling more than $4.6 billion, were potentially fraudulent. A recent report from the Project on Government Oversight found that 95% of PPP loans have been forgiven. And one of the lessons learned is to slow the process down and not panic. Don't let fear take over from logical thinking and common sense. Now, the Small Business Administration is trying to get some of the money back, but questions are being raised how to better handle taxpayer money during the next crisis. I'm Ryan Smith reporting. And now here's a look over Washington, D.C., where the Department of Homeland Security is urging Americans to be on alert virtually everywhere they go this holiday season. The newly released pre-holiday terrorism bulletin says extremist individuals or small groups pose a, quote, persistent and lethal threat to the country. Here are the places they say are at the highest risk. You can see them here. Schools, large public gatherings, faith-based facilities, government buildings, and critical U.S. infrastructure. In addition, DHS says racial and religious minorities, the LGBTQ community, and members of the media are all at a higher risk of becoming the targets of political or social extremists. The new advisory pointing to the recent shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado, as well as threats to the Jewish community in New Jersey earlier this month. DHS says it's constantly working with other federal agencies to assess potential threats, but they say you should be vigilant in most settings and report anything you see suspicious. School scares across Georgia, leaving families on edge after a dozen counties throughout the state received hoax calls about active shooters at several school campuses. One of the targets of those fake calls was Savannah High School, where authorities say the caller claimed six people had been shot. Several police departments and the state FBI patrol responded and locked down the campus shortly after the call. The Board of Education, the police department chief, says they train year around for situations just like this. Staff did a tremendous job. We cannot be too cautious. We have to respond. And today we responded appropriately. During the initial response, some parents came to the school checking if their child was safe. One mother says some students were visibly shaken. They were trying to get away to make sure they get to their parents or they, they next to family member. It didn't matter who face they see, they was coming to them. And half of the students that was coming to me wasn't even my children itself. And you can really feel for what those parents are going through. After the building was all clear, the school day went on. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp issuing a statement via Twitter saying the FBI is actively investigating and will use their resources to find who is responsible for what he calls domestic terrorism. A new report showing the surge in gun violence in the U.S. isn't impacting everyone equally. A study published by the medical journal JAMA Network Open found firearm deaths surged during the pandemic, jumping more than 25 percent from 2019 to 2021. But the homicide rate among young black men ages 20 to 24 was nearly 10 times higher than the overall number of gun deaths just last year. Experts point to two control contributing factors, disadvantages at the neighborhood level, and exposure to gun violence at an individual level. But gun sales also surged Black Friday weekend. The FBI reporting just under 200,000 background checks were submitted on Black Friday for firearm purchases, making it the third highest day for gun sales ever. Gun sellers say more people have been buying firearms after President Biden threatened to ban assault rifles and several high-profile mass shootings. Meantime, a string of rideshare robberies has drivers on alert in Baltimore. The National Desk Vincent Hill spoke with an Uber driver about what it's like behind the wheel. It's a simple concept. The click of a button, the car arrives, and off you go. Anything could happen. But for some drivers and riders, it's not that simple. And safety is their top concern. After police say a rideshare passenger was robbed and beaten after leaving the Horseshoe Casino early Monday morning. Since we've learned about that incident, BPD told us they're working with multiple rideshare companies 
after similar stories. I've been driving for about like two months or so. Like many Americans, for Brandon, times are hard. You just need a little bit of extra money, you know? Anything helps. The economy is going up. Inflation is always going up. Even with the worries about making ends meet, Brandon says being a rideshare driver comes with a much bigger concern. I'm always concerned about the area that I'm in, especially if it looks a little sketchy. Um, and especially if the passenger looks a little sketchy, you know, you got a bunch of abandoned homes here, which makes the area look even more sketchy. Recent rideshare robberies and other crimes is what economist and so at the end of the Anibon Basu says is keeping Baltimore from thriving. Baltimore is one of the most dangerous cities in America, and it's actually one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Uh, and that has more than any other factor, I would argue, kept us away from fulfilling our economic potential. But just how much potential? Basu says the number is staggering. Hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions over the course of time, if you go back far enough in time. If the city were safe, I can tell you, Baltimore City would put Nashville, Tennessee's economic boom to shame. But the crime numbers show Baltimore is far from being a place tourists would flock to, according to Basu. If people don't feel safe, they don't visit. If people don't feel safe, they don't invest. They don't start businesses. Meantime, if drivers don't feel safe, there may not be anyone left to pick up those riders who do decide to visit Baltimore. I try not to judge off a of first encounter. I just try to keep in mind that uh, I need to stay safe and don't do anything crazy behind me. Taking a live look over Austin, Texas, where Travis County officials are starting to hand out the overdose reversal drug Narcan to bars and clubs. As 2022 comes to an end, the county is on track to double the amount of deadly overdoses reported last year. Now officials are turning to outreach programs to support those at highest risk. Outreach workers describe keeping Narcan on hand like having a fire extinguisher at the ready. No one wants their house to catch on fire, but if you do, you certainly want to have a fire extinguisher. We need to carry Narcan. We need to make it safe for everybody. Officials say they're hoping to expand this program to other places that see high overdose cases like hotels. President Biden signing a marijuana research bill into law. Our fact check team digs into the business of legal cannabis sales and some of the concerns Americans still have about the drug. Congressional lawmakers held a hearing earlier this month to discuss federal marijuana legalization. Now, if more or all states allow the sale of marijuana, just how much could they benefit financially? I'm back with a fact check team tonight. Courtney, where it's already legal and taxed, how much are these states breaking in? We looked into it, and according to the Marijuana Policy Project, as of March, states reported a total of $11.2 billion in tax revenue from legal cannabis sales to adults. Break it down a little more for us. Where exactly is this happening? There are currently 21 states and D.C with laws that legalize, tax, and regulate cannabis for adults over the age of 21, including Colorado, Washington, California, and Michigan, to name a few. Rhode Island is newer on the list, legalizing cannabis earlier this year and will start sales in December. And get this, we found reports that project in just the first seven months, the state would see about $41 million in sales and generate $2.9 million in sales tax revenue. Voters in Maryland and Missouri also voted to legalize marijuana earlier this month, so it'll be legal in Maryland in July of 2023 and Missouri as early as February. Sure, now it's some big money, no doubt about that, but critics would say that legalization comes at a human cost that could eventually down the line also have financial implications. Janae, the facts behind that. Well, Eugene, we looked at a 2020 report from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it said some research suggests marijuana is likely to lead to use and abuse of other drugs, including nicotine. Now, it also said that based on data, adult marijuana users were more likely to develop an alcohol use disorder than adults who don't use the substance. Sure. How big of a concern is this? Well, the agency said that while some data points to the idea that marijuana could be a gateway drug, the majority of people who use it don't go on to use harder substances. There is an alternative hypothesis, which is that people who are more vulnerable to drug use are more likely to start with more accessible substances like marijuana, tobacco, or alcohol, and their social interactions with other users heighten their chances of trying other drugs. But the bottom line is further research is needed to determine if marijuana can truly be deemed a gateway drug. Sure. Ladies, thank you so much for your work on this. And for more on the Fact Check team's research on this topic, including some links to where they found their information, scan that QR code there at the bottom of your screen or visit us at thenationaldesk.com. 
A delivery driver tossing packages onto a road. Coming up, what a couple did to make sure the packages were delivered to those expecting them. And hospitals accused of leaving homeless patients outside a nonprofit with no notice. The steps the charity is taking to bring awareness to the problem. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the Pulse of America, starting in Ohio, where one man started delivering packages after watching a FedEx driver toss them onto the side of the road. Zach Arnwine and his fiance were driving along State Route 123 just east of Route 4 on Friday evening. His fiance saw a FedEx truck with its flashers on and she thought it looked like the driver was throwing something on the side of the road. When we turned around, he was already gone. So we pulled up where he was and there was packages laying everywhere. So we decided to pick them up. Here's a picture of Zach and his newfound packages. I called every number on each box and told them that I had their package and I, I will deliver them to their house. So you were going to be the delivery guy for the night. What did they think when you when they got the calls from you? Just amazed. Uh, kept thanking me so much because they said their package was delivered and it never was. Roy Charbonneau was one of those customers. He got a text message from FedEx saying that his package and a second one had been delivered. On the way home, we get a call, and it's a number I don't know. And I usually don't answer numbers I don't know, but I did. And it was a guy named Zach, and he said he had our package. Charbonneau filed a complaint and says FedEx told him it's under investigation. You're not very hopeful, it sounds like. No, not at all. Interesting story there. In Las Vegas, local charities say hospitals are leaving homeless patients on their doorsteps, and it needs to stop. The CEO of Catholic Charities saying patients get dropped off at their door a couple times a week to a couple times a day, with many of them still in need of medical attention. Most of the people that get discharged here go back to the hospital because they weren't really ready to be discharged yet. Just last month, the city worked to improve relations between shelters and hospitals by organizing a tour for hospitals employees to visit homeless service provider campuses. In Porterville, California, fire officials are warning people about the dangers of Chinese lanterns after one was spotted floating around a neighborhood. You can see it here. Homeowners say after the lantern was spotted, pieces began dropping from the sky and landing on the houses below. Low. The fire was put out by a neighbor, but officials say the damage could have been much worse. The risk of the lantern coming down, uh, landing in a residential neighborhood is, is one of our greatest, uh, greatest risks. Um, can cause fire, can cause damage to people's property, can even you know, cause loss of life. Back in 2012, the state of California banned the use of Chinese lanterns due to the potential fire hazard. Coming up on the National Desk, back on shelves, we're talking to a doctor about how much longer some popular medications could be difficult to find.
As flu and RSV cases surge, it's putting a strain on medical professionals nationwide. Now a new issue, a shortage of key medications to help children fight infections. Earlier this week, I sat down with family medicine physician Dr. Erica Aragona to see what's causing the shortage of amoxicillin and other drugs. Unfortunately, we're in the cold and flu season, right? But we're not just seeing viruses. You have to keep in mind when we have close quarters of people gathering for holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, other holidays where we celebrate or school being back in session, a lot of things can spread and not just viruses. So we're seeing bacterial infections across the board rise as well. So we're treating that with the appropriate medication. And unfortunately, amoxicillin is one of the most common medications that we use as an antibiotic. So this short Shortage is hitting us really hard, especially in the pediatric population, since it's usually a well-tolerated medicine that we can't really get as much anymore. And what's really concerning, it's not just amoxicillin. There have been reports a children's Tylenol shortage is impacting Canada and carrying over into the U.S. So are you seeing that? Do you know what is behind that? We're starting to see a little bit up here in the United States, certainly not as much as in Canada, but you're totally right. There is a shortage that's ongoing right now in Canada. And as a result, consumers are starting to go to the United States to get that product. Canada released a statement stating that they noted a large shortage, mostly because the demand just was so much higher. Parents were buying children's products very, very commonly, not as much as they did over the spring and the summer. And as a trickling effect, now they're looking to other areas such as the United States and as a result, we're not seeing as much of that product here. Now, the United States has not issued any type of a concern for a shortage here, but we are seeing some people kind of hoarding and buying this in mass because they're concerned that it will run out. Uh, so uh, we are starting to see a less amount here in states. That's a really good point, Dr. Erica. You know, what should parents do in the meantime? They're concerned about this. Do we know how long these key meds are going to be in short supply? That's a great question, and I wish I had that answer for you. I don't, but what I can tell parents is first and foremost, not every fever is bad. In fact, fever is a great way that our immune systems are fighting infections. So unless your physician tells you that you need to medicate your child, oftentimes a low-grade fever is okay, and you can treat your child just with things like a cool bath or cool washcloths. Same thing for pain, warm baths or other medications such as ibuprofen, children's strength, of course, can can be used. Now, this is not good for everyone, and I always caution parents to talk with your doctor first. But keep this in mind. I really want to drive this home. If you have adult Tylenol, do not give that to your children, okay? If you have expired acetaminophen products, do not give that to your children. That's where the danger lies. So when in doubt, always ask your doctor. Dr. Aria, Eric had some really great information. As always, thank you so much for joining us here on the National Desk. Absolutely. Well, the runoff for Georgia's U.S. Senate seat just days away. A look at the record number of voters that have already cast their ballots.
A new study shows a four-day work week could be a win-win for companies and their workers. More than 900 employees from 33 companies work the shortened schedule as part of the six-month study led by Boston College researchers. They found average revenue rose nearly 40 percent compared to when they worked five straight days in the same period the previous year. The workers also liked the shorter work week, saying they had less stress and burnout. Now for a look at the top trending stories on our website right now. The world's largest active volcano erupting for the first time in Hawaii after nearly 40 years. Scientists say Mauna Loa is not threatening any communities or property. And former NFL wide receiver Antonio Brown facing an arrest warrant for a domestic incident. Tampa police said it was for a battery charge. Plus, Christine McVie, the singer-songwriter responsible for some of Fleetwood Mac's biggest hits, has died. Her family says she passed away peacefully at a hospital in the company of family following a brief illness. McVie was 79. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, voters head to the polls Tuesday in Georgia for the Senate runoff race between Senator Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. More than 1.4 million ballots have been cast so far. And a rare astronomical event will take place Wednesday night. For about 30 minutes, the moon will occult Mars. That means the red planet will briefly disappear behind the moon. Can't wait to see that. Also, Friday, November's producer price index is set to be released. It's a measure of inflation at the wholesale level. The Biden administration set to release more oil from the nation's reserve before the end of the year. The reserve at a record low. Coming up next, the White House plans to refill it. And ongoing border crisis. The former acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection joining us next to discuss the very latest, including the deployment of U.S. Air Marshals. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. And, of course, anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Supply chain struggle, the COVID pandemic in the rearview mirror, but product shortages may not be a thing of the past. What's fueling uncertainty tonight that could lead to empty store shelves? Plus, compensating customers, how some banks are working to help customers scammed on a popular payment app. And Twitter app dispute resolved. CEO Elon Musk revealing what was done to ease tensions between the social media platform and Apple. This is The National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Didi Gatton. Growing concerns over the nation's fragile supply chain. As the season of gift giving is upon us, we wanted to take a look at what's driving the issue. Inside Your World investigates Mark Hyman reporting for The National Desk. A series of supply chain woes. It's also keeping a focus on supply chain issues. Since COVID spread across the globe nearly three years ago, We've heard reports about the nation's supply chain shortages, and we've seen those empty store shelves. But with the pandemic mostly in the rearview mirror, why aren't those supply chain issues fading into the background like the virus? In a word, trucks. The trucking industry, and especially the long haul companies, is experiencing a serious shortage of drivers. We pegged the driver shortage uh, this year at um, roughly 80,000. 
American Trucking Association Chief Economist Bob Costello says he expects that shortfall will only increase over the next decade. It could hit 160,000 at current trends. These shortages are on the mind of Daryl Harris every day. He's the president of Yellow Trucking, one of the largest shipping companies in America. He told us the worker shortage in his line of work boils down to age. Trucking is an industry where uh, a, a predominant amount of the drivers, you know, particularly are, you know, they're baby boomers. You know, these are folks that are uh, pretty close to retirement in some cases. Millennial and Gen Z workers, it turns out, are taking a pass on driving long haul trucks. And as an aging fleet of drivers retire, there aren't nearly enough replacements to get behind the wheel. We're going to need to replace about a million jobs here in the coming decade. So we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, need to bring a lot of younger folks into the industry. One of the solutions, he told us, would be to attract more women to this male-dominated profession, like Esther Parsons. Ten years ago, five years ago, I would have never pictured myself driving a big old truck. She had to wait for her children to head off to college before she could climb into her big rig. She left behind a windowless office job of 20 years. Now this is my office. I have the best window in the world. Daryl Harris told us freight delivery companies must change in order to attract a younger and more female workforce who have different priorities than retiring baby boomers. His company is among the industry leaders in putting long haul drivers in hotel rooms rather than having them sleep in their cabs. There's a different level of expectation uh, relative to quality of life. But putting more drivers behind the wheel only solves one growing problem. Bob Costello said the state of the nation's highway system is adding to the supply chain problem. This includes growing traffic congestion around the nation and the lack of enough parking for drivers to safely pull off the road for required breaks and sleeping. Drivers quit early during, be, to, if they can find a parking spot for the night. Then think about over a, a span of a, of, of a year, how many more loads each one of those drivers could do. The demand for getting items delivered to our front door took off during the pandemic, and it continues to grow. For Esther Parsons, that amounts to a silver lining for an industry long taken for granted by the public. Now we have a totally new respect and different respect for truck drivers who are out here moving America every day, and I think that's a good thing. For Inside Your World Investigates, I'm Mark Hyman in Kansas City. Mark, thank you. Some of the nation's biggest banks are considering compensating customers who were scammed through the payment app Zelle. The Wall Street Journal reporting J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo and Bank of America are in discussions to make a plan to refund customers and each other for scam money transfers. The hope is to boost security and trust in Zelle, which is owned by several banks. The growing number of payment app scams has pushed lawmakers to pressure banks to do more to help fraud victims. Twitter CEO Elon Musk walking back a re recent accusation now saying Apple was not considering pulling the social media platform from its app store. Musk says it was a misunderstanding that was resolved when he met with Apple CEO Tim Cook. Last month, Musk gave little explanation when he accused Apple of censorship, saying the company threatened to block Twitter. And another social media platform policy shift, this one at Snapchat. Parent company Snap wants workers back in the office in the new year. A spokesperson says employees will transition to a 80-20 hybrid model, meaning in-office work 80% of the time and 20% remote. The policy kicks in at the end of February. The U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a case centering on a controversial Homeland Security directive regarding deportations. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas directing ICE to prioritize arresting and deporting undocumented migrants, migrants with the greatest risk to public safety while largely looking away at others. Critics, including many Republicans, say it skirts federal law while allowing people to remain in the U.S. illegally. But the Biden administration argues Congress hasn't provided enough funding to detain everyone in the country illegally and prioritizing potentially 
potentially dangerous people is the right thing to do. The Supreme Court's decision is expected in June. Meantime, New York City is opening a fourth humanitarian emergency response and relief center as it now finds itself with more than 27,000 asylum seekers in its care. The centers offer migrants bus there from border states, a place to stay, support services, and help getting to their final destination. Mayor Eric Adams is asking for federal and state support. A Venezuelan tent city at the border outside of El Paso reportedly taken down by Mexican authorities and DHS Secretary Mayorkas removing hundreds of federal air marshals from protecting flights and sending them to border instead. Former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection Mark Morgan talked to our Jan Jeffcoat about the border crisis. On Sunday, a Venezuelan migrants camp set up on the Mexico side of the U.S. border was dismantled by Mexico's police because of what they said were very dangerous security concerns. Now, this type of migrant camp, Mark, set up on the border is really nothing new. So, so why now? What triggered the government of Mexico, do you think, to finally act? Yeah, Jan, so you're right, and that's a good question. We have seen camp. Now, what made this camp a little bit different is this was 100% made up of Venezuelans. And why was this happening? Well, a couple of months ago, if you recall, the administration decided using, to use Title 42, the public health border, to start removing Venezuelans. But like so much of what they do, it really didn't make sense and it wasn't applied broadly across the board because at the same time, they weren't applying it to Cubans. Nicaraguans, which we've also seen a skyrocket in the number of illegal aliens from those countries as well. And so that's when we saw a few weeks ago, if you recall, the images of a, a, a large group, a massive group of Venezuelans carrying a, a six foot by 10 foot Venezuelan flag, literally uh, rushing our border and attacking border patrol agents. But then a judge said, hey, Title 42 has got to end. That's when he started seeing this camp grow in numbers. And so uh, to anticipation of Title 42 ending, uh, that's why we saw the governor of Mexico come in and dismantle this camp. But keep in mind, Jam, th again, this is not substance. Nothing's going to change here. Every single day, we see six to 8,000 illegal aliens come across our border every 24 hours. And the government of Mexico and the United States have done nothing but incentivize and encourage that activity. So this is to avoid what I believe is just another bad visual image uh, when Title 42 ends of a couple of thousand uh, 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 um, Venezuelans rushing our border. It's about political optics, not substance. And this tent city in Juarez, uh, as you mentioned, was dismantled. But where do these rioters and these looters go once these camps are dismantled? Don't they just set up another one in a different area near the border and, until they can make their way across? Yeah, Jan, you're exactly right. You know, that, that's very possible. What, what we're seeing right now, though, is so Mexico is going to take them. They're going to disperse them among some shelters on the Mexico side. I think they're probably having conversations with them saying, hey, just relax, calm down, wait a couple of weeks. Title 42 is going to end and you're going to be able to join the six to eight thousand illegal aliens that the United States is letting in every 24 hours and you're going to be a lot in. So just calm down. Now, we could see another camp set up. Um, I, I really don't see there would be a need for it because, like I said, a couple of weeks when Title 42 comes in, they're going to be allowed in just like the other thousands every single day. Mark, since the 9-11 attacks, we've realized the vital role that air marshals play in protecting air safety and have since increased the number of air marshals. But now we are seeing reports that these air marshals are being removed and deployed to the ground there at the southern border. What's going on here? Yeah, Jan, look, I really appreciate you asking this question. This is something you and I have talked about before. And that's why I've said for a very long time that illegal immigration is not a victimless crime. Why do I say that? Because valuable resources are pulled off the line. It's not just Border Patrol agents where we see 80 to 90 percent of them pulled off the line to process millions and millions of illegal aliens, leaving our borders wide open that the cartels can exploit. That's how drugs are pouring in. That's how criminals are pouring in and potential national security threats. Look, officers are pulled away from their primary job at our ports of entry. We have DHS volunteers that have been pulled away uh, from their missions as well. And now the United States Marshals are being pulled away. This is another example of how what's happening on the southern border impacts our ability to secure uh, our country and many other areas. The Biden administration working to restore the nation's oil reserve. Our fact check team looking at how the White House plans on making that happen amid high oil prices. 
Right now, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is at its lowest level in 38 years, and the Biden administration plans to release another 180 million barrels by the end of this year. Now back with the fact check teams, Connor and Janae. Connor, what's the administration's plan to replenish that supply? In October, the White House made an announcement that the administration would repurchase crude oil for the reserve if prices for oil per barrel dropped roughly 67 to $72 or less. Okay, why that specific range, though? A Biden administration official said this specific range would be low enough to be considered a quote good taxpayer investment but it's worth noting that under the previous administration former president donald trump directed the department of energy to purchase oil for the reserve when prices were even lower at thirty dollars thirty dollars compare that to the sixty something seventy a big difference there uh, what's the barrel currently trading at it's higher than the administration's threshold and we looked at government data for two of the most widely used benchmarks of oil prices which are the wti and brent and as of november 21st prices for wti hovered around eighty dollars and Brent was closer to 88. Now, those prices are changing all the time, so if you scan that QR code at the bottom of your screens, we have a link for you on the website if you want to track those. Yeah, that's still a ways away even from that upper end of that threshold. Jane, do we expect the prices to drop? Well, Eugene, it looks that way. Even though we are a little higher than that $67 to $72 benchmark, oil prices have been falling. Now, give us the facts here. What's behind the drop? So there's a few things, right? So one, this is a trend. It's normal for oil prices to drop during the fall after the summer driving season winds down. But demand Demand for fuel usually picks back up in December. And two, global demand is lower because COVID restrictions in China have kept demand weaker. There and some of the world's major economies have signaled they are heading towards a recession. Lots of variables involved. Let's see what happens even during the winter months, uh, right around the corner as well. Ladies, thank you. I take a deeper dive into the oil reserve and the fact check team sources for this by scanning that QR code you see right there at the bottom of your screen. You can also head on over to thenationaldesk.com on your mobile device or laptop. Repeated break-ins costing businesses big. Straight ahead, stores struggling to stay afloat, dealing with a crime surge. Then, avoiding internet scams this holiday shopping season. How to verify you're getting the real deal. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting with costly business break-ins in Seattle. Surveillance video from Begin. A jewelry store in Ballard catches this person torching the glass door before taking off. MK Byrne is the owner and wasn't signed while it happened. Somebody who wants to come in, take everything I've worked so hard for and make their own money with it. Burns says she heard the glass shatter, but the person never made it in because there were police nearby. They smashed a case or got an armful of something, you know, that just already puts me behind so far. You know, if somebody got in and actually started doing something, um, I just can't afford it. This is the sixth time she's had to deal with a break-in or attempted one since opening up more than a year ago. It's violating personally, because this is like, in some ways, even more precious than my home. Back in March, a thief broke into her store and quickly grabbed what he could. Byrne also happened to be inside then and threw things at him and got him to climb out. <laughs> Tis the season for lots of packages. Christmas, uh, we have a, a, a large uptick in uh, parcels being delivered by the post office. For porch pirates, those parcels can be easy pickings. Porch pirates are opportunistic in nature, just like male bees. And um, they're not necessarily targeting anything. It's just uh, kind of a, a random uh, pick. They just want something that's easy. Scrooges are also finding ways to scam you before you click ship. Don't log into a website unless you normally would. For example, if somebody sends you a link and an email, uh, don't click that email link to go log in. The best option, of course, is to pick up the mail as close to the delivery time uh, as possible. If you can't be there around delivery time, the best thing to do is uh, either have a trusted uh, friend or neighbor pick that up for you. 
many people that are shopping online certainly are looking for bargains. One of the most common scams is called a shadow website, where they reel you in with low prices. It looks very official, but it will get people to go on and purchase products and capture the payment card information. It can be tricky to verify these websites, but it is possible. Look for uh, what I'll say misspellings. Specifically in the URL, there's really no need for you to create an account to purchase things online. Today, many websites ask you to create an account. So if you do, don't reuse passwords. Internet scammers are also actively trying to get your information by sending links through text messages or emails. You may install malware that you're not aware of. Just like computers, phones are also at risk. A lot of the, the hacks now and so forth are targeting the mobile devices because you're keeping your bank account information on there. You're some good advice still to come. Our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from vaccine military mandate pushback to the collapse of cryptocurrency exchange FTX. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. For some perspective, I'm joined by national correspondent Atra Elnishar and chief political correspondent Scott Thuman. Scott, Congress trying to wrap up a long list of items before breaking for the holidays, but there's a slight hitch with the defense bill. Talk to us about that. Yeah, Steve, we're talking about the National Defense Authorization Act, and this is essentially the Pentagon's budget every year. It goes through a process on Capitol Hill, typically gets approved, even with some arguing, and it's a bit of a no-brainer. This year, a hiccup perhaps. Some Republican senators have decided to say they are not willing to pass it unless there can be a vote on the floor about whether or not to remove the vaccine mandate in the military, the COVID vaccine mandate that right now service members are subject to. What they're claiming is that this is an unfair, unjust mandate and as a result, that it is hurting recruiting numbers for the military. Now, it's a little tough right now to determine if that is the real reason for a decline in recruiting and retention in the military, but it certainly could be a factor. A lot of people believe so. In the first six months of Biden's presidency, the numbers stayed relatively the same as far as military population. However, when the COVID vaccine mandate was instituted, you also, uh, in this same time period, had the, the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. You had the war begin in Ukraine with Russia intensifying. Uh, all of these things may be contributing factors, but nonetheless, you saw about a 6% decline in military members who were willing to serve uh, in that time. Uh, that's in the Army. Across all branches, it was almost a 3% decline. And so now you've got these Republicans saying, this is a problem. We want to blame the COVID mandate as part of that problem. And so we want that vote. We don't know how long it may hold it up. Might just be a slight delay. Could be a bigger problem if they want to make it one. Uh, but that's an issue that we're going to keep a close eye on here on Capitol Hill as they continue to try and get everything done before the end of this lame duck session. Yeah, something to watch closely, especially as these uh, as COVID uh, starts to spread again, maybe through the winter. It'll be interesting to see if these debates continue on uh, on COVID. Atra, turning to the uh, cryptocurrency crash with the collapse of cryptocurrency exchange FTX. Congress ramping up its its scrutiny of the industry. Yeah, as if as if Congress didn't uh, needed another thing to add to their to do list. But this is a really urgent issue, and it's one that Congress has wanted to address for quite some time. Uh, why haven't they? Uh, who knows? Perhaps some don't fully understand how to do it because it's such a a different kind of commodity. So what we're talking about is this 30 year old now former CEO of of FTX, Sam Bankman Fried, who suspected, accused of basically taking uh, customer funds and investing them uh, into his hedge fund and essentially losing all of that money. Uh, so yesterday, the Senate Agriculture Committee, which oversees uh, commodity regulation and things like that, held a hearing uh, about what went wrong and how Congress should act. And essentially uh, what they came to the conclusion of is that there are just these huge regulatory gaps that allowed this to happen and unfortunately 
could be happening again. Who's to say? Because the the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is has just a little bit of statutory authority to investigate this kind of thing, can only really look into something if there's a whistleblower complaint. And there unfortunately wasn't in this case, and a lot of people lost their life savings. Uh, so there was legislation to fill those gaps proposed by Debbie Stabenow and, and Senator Guzman, the, the, the ranking member on the Senate Ag Committee, hasn't gone anywhere. And we all know when a new Congress starts, everything essentially starts from scratch. Atra, Scott, thank you both. Didi, back to you. Thanks, guys. Hectic hiring push amid a tight labor market. Coming up next, what companies are doing to attract workers that could open up opportunities for thousands of Americans. Companies having a hard time hiring are taking a new approach. As the National Desk Angela Brown reports, many companies are now dropping the college degree requirement. Right now, there are roughly 10.7 million jobs open, nearly two jobs for every unemployed person. So there is a talent shortage in addition to some businesses realizing many positions never needed a college degree. A college degree no longer required as companies adjust to hire. The Wall Street Journal reporting U.S. job postings requiring a bachelor's degree, 41 percent in November, down from 46 percent early 2019. Career strategist Julie Balke says dropping a college degree will attract talent. Some organizations have said preferred but not required. So what they've done is they've broadened the net. They put the net out there and it pulls more people in. And then they decide, based on who's pulled in, who meets the requirements. Look no further than IBM. In 2021, announcing IBM now stripping bachelor's degree requirements for more than half of U.S. job openings. Bank of America, four-year degree, not always necessary. Netflix boasting about advancement without a college degree. And this article profiling employees. We've all known people with degrees who can't, multiple degrees, who can't find their way out of a paper bag. But we also know people who don't have degrees who are fabulous. Even the federal government is making the shift. This executive order last year limiting use of educational requirements in federal service contracts, noting that an over-reliance on college degrees excludes capable candidates. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Interesting report. That's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend.